Gene is my favorite, but uh, and this this gal I've never heard over here. I mean, it's, if you if you weren't blessed by that, uh, we need to call Roseneath Hillcrest, because uh, I'm telling you that's uh, worth coming for just to to hear that. I feel like a, after a thunderstorm following that. I, what I want to do today is encourage you. I, how many of you have had all the encouragement you can stand on really want anymore? Just let me see your hand. Oh, good, good. I got a good audience then because all of us need encouragement. And the, the, our greatest encouragement is in Christ, the blessings and the benefits that we have in Christ Jesus. And I want you to, in your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 5. I love to preach out of Romans because Christians can find that book. It's you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and Romans. You can get there. And many scholars believe that Romans is the key to understanding the Bible. My two favorite books in the Bible, Philippians and Romans. Martin Luther said Romans is a perfect gospel. The constitution of Christianity the constitution of Christianity. You get your doctrine out of Romans. Tyndall said every, every person should memorize Romans. <laughs> you think about that. I, I, I have three verses memorized. Uh, memorize the book of Romans. Griffith Thomas said every person should read the entire book in one sitting and do that every day for 30 days. Think how life-changing it would be if we took that seriously and spent hours and hours and hours just in that one book. It would be life-changing. In the first four chapters, chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, Paul nails down justification. We're saved by faith, by grace, through faith. In Christ alone. Jesus saves, only Jesus saves. He nails that down in the first four chapters. Then in chapter 5, he takes the last two words of chapter 4, our justification. Justification means just as if I'd not sinned. That's how God sees you in Christ, just as if you had never sinned. He sees us righteous in Christ. So in, in our justification then is what Paul is going to lay out the blessings and the benefits of our new position in Christ. Paul lists six of them, but there are many, many, many more. He just lists six. I, uh, E.V. Hill is... Uh, Years ago, I used to be one of my favorite preachers. I think he's probably in heaven now, uh, out in California. In fact, Lee and I went out there to his church. He, has, he had 77 committees, but all 77 committees had one purpose. That's to reach out to people in love and ministry and win them to Christ. All 77 committees. And E.V. Hill preached a sermon at Moody. And the title of the sermon is, What Do You Have When You Have Jesus? And he had 12 points. He was invited back the next year to preach again. And he got up to preach and he said, We begin now with point 13. Because what you have when you have Jesus, we can never say enough. None of us can grasp or fully know all the benefits and all the blessings we have. What we do know is the more we know about Jesus, the better it gets. The more we understand, the more blessed we are. It's like this guy in his one church, and he had a small country church, and he, had, he was a diabetic, and he didn't, didn't speak plainly, and, and every Sunday, he, he would just say over and over, it just gets dooder and dooder and dooder and dooder. And then he starts saying it gets, just gets dooder and dooder and tweeter and tweeter. <laughs> and he's every, he said it every Sunday. And, but, but then 
he got really bad with diabetes and so the people, they couldn't wait for him to come back to church because how can you be positive about that? He came back that next Sunday after getting out of a long hospital deal. And he said, you know, I knew it was getting dooder and dooder and tweeter and tweeter, but I didn't know the Lord was turning me into Tugger. <laughs> well, it just gets dooder and dooder when you start realizing the benefits, the blessings we have in Jesus Christ. So number one is peace. Verse 1, therefore, when you find a therefore in Scripture, you ask, what's it there for? It's pointing back to the first four chapters. Therefore, now that Paul has laid it out for us that we're justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, before Christ, we were estranged from God, separated from God, even hostile toward God. But now... Now, I love when I see that in Scripture, many times in Scripture. But now, but now we are justified, declared righteous by Christ's death on the cross. You see, the cross bridged the gap between sinful man and holy God. When Christ died on that cross and he said, it is finished, done, then that provided salvation, no longer separated because of God's grace and Christ's death on that cross. He paid our sin debt. All of it. It's finished. And it's all by grace. None of us deserve salvation. None of us can earn salvation. It is grace from beginning to end. It's a double blessing we find here with the peace of God. We have peace with God. That happened when Christ died on the cross and died for our sins and brought us together. We were separated from God. Now we're brought together. No longer estranged, no longer hostile. We are with God and with God forever. So we have the peace with God, declared righteous. But then the other part of that blessing is we have the peace of God. We have that inner peace, that inner tranquility, that no matter how rough life gets, and at times life can get rough for any of us, we go through difficult times. But no matter what the difficulty, no matter how great the problem, the situation, God is able to give us an inner peace that transcends all understanding. Because when you're in a situation where it makes no sense for anybody to have peace, but you have that inner peace because you know God has got you. That God is in control. In the storms of life, the peace of God, Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Amen? What a great verse. Peace. The second benefit and blessing is access. Verse 2, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Remember in the Old Testament, God was separated from his people. Uh, you saw God from a distance. Adam and Eve blew it for us. I mean, they sinned in the garden, and we won't talk about which one caused it. Started at first. But Adam and Eve made a huge mistake and they sinned. And so there came that, that separation from God. They were kicked out of the garden. And from that point on, only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God. And that was only one time a year on the Day of Atonement. In fact, there, there's some who tried to get into the Holy of Holies, tried to get in access to God, and what happened to them? They were killed on the spot. So you, you couldn't do that. You would die on the spot. So we've been separated from God, and, and access was limited to one time of year just by the high priest. But, but now, through Jesus, 
we are granted admittance into the presence of God. He opened up, veil was torn, he opened up the way. She couldn't go through the veil, you'd die. But opened up so that you and I could come into the presence of a holy God. That is, the, that is amazing to think that you and I could have a conversation with God. That we could enter into his presence. He's perfect. He is holy. We are sinners unholy. But because of Jesus, Jesus was Emmanuel. God with us. So because of Jesus, the curtain has come down. The veil is rent in two. We have access to God all the time. We can live in his presence, walk in his presence, serve in his presence. I was uh, invited to presidential prayer breakfast. I got there and I flew into Washington and I'd never done anything like this before. Didn't know what I was doing. Didn't even know why I was there. But I go up to that. They, they have signs what, we're, what we have to do. I had to go up to this window and uh, give them my name. And they had my stuff. They had my tickets and whatever I, ne I needed. And so I handed my stuff to the guy and he, he looked at it and he got my stuff and he said, uh, are you a senator? And I said, no. He said, well, you're somebody important or you wouldn't have this pass. You have an all access pass. And so I didn't know what all that meant. I just said, I thought, well, that sounds good to me. So I, when I go to that thing, they have an overflow room where most people sit. Then they have the room where you can actually get in there where that's happening and where the president is. And then part of that, half of that is roped off. So you have to be senators and kings. There's a king there uh, in that part. And then there's the platform and, and whatever's behind the platform. And as the night unfolded, uh, I realized that, that I was down there inside the ropes with all those people. And the king was over there at that next table, the king of Jordan. And, and then we, you know, we, we went through that whole thing and the president spoke and, and all the things they do at, at that thing. And then I got to go behind the platform after it was over where the guys who were on the platform were. And, and, got, and shook hands with some people I didn't even want to shake hands with and we won't give names there. <laughs> but two hours of total access was something that, that I never thought that, that I would experience. But those two hours of total access to powerful people is absolutely nothing compared to access to God. And here, listen to me. Listen carefully. I got two hours with these people who, you know, people look up to. Two hours with them. I got to sit in the room. With God, I get to move into the palace. Total access 24 7 forever. Doesn't get any better than that. The benefit and blessing we have is that you and I, sinners, have access to God 24 7. Now, hope is the third. Hope. Verse 2b. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And verse 5 says, a hope that does not disappoint. How many of you have ever hoped for something and got disappointed? Let me see your hand. All right, the rest of you are liars. You need this sermon too. <laughs> Seems like we, most of the time we, we, we don't, it doesn't measure up to what we hoped it would be. We're disappointed so often. 
But we have a hope that does not ever disappoint because our hope is rooted in God's love and it is secure in God's grace. As believers, as believers, we will receive everything we have been told we will receive and everything we hope for in Christ, we will receive. Now, that, uh, that's beyond excitement because what God is offering us is beyond our greatest dreams. But we'll never be disappointed. I mean, I promise you right now, I don't know when you're going to heaven. It you know, could be today, could be next year, could be 10 years now, 100 years from now. But when you get there, I just do not believe you're going to say, ah, not what I thought it was. <laughs> it's like when I took my grandchild out to, she wanted to go on a date we went on a date and I don't know she was like this and she wanted to go to Raff and Kaku's we went to Raff and Kaku's and we sat down she's all dressed up and she's looking around and she said well this is not what I was expecting I'm disappointed and I said well what do you mean I mean this is a nice place she said well I you know I just thought it'd be chandeliers and this is this beautiful room and then over next to it would would be this big ballroom and after we ate would they would go over there and dance in this i said laura lee you've been watching too much tv <laughs> but she said tell you one thing it was better than my first date i said what do you mean she said my first date with my daddy i said well, why why was it bad she said well i wanted to go to the cafeteria because he told me I could get anything that I wanted. And she said, I got everything I wanted. And we got to the cash register. And dad reached in his pocket and he left his bill for at home. And we had to put all the food back. I was so embarrassed. It's the worst date I ever had. Well, in Christ, you will never, ever be disappointed. We have that hope. We rejoice in that hope that will never disappoint us. Because one day we're going to die and we're going to wake up in heaven and we're going to see Jesus face to face. And it will be worth it all when we see Christ. And if you didn't shout here, you're going to shout there. <laughs> Number four is joy. Verse three, not only so, and I listen, Paul just gets more excited. Not only is all this great, but not only is that so, but it just gets better. But we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. You see, we have peace with God through Christ, death on the cross. Know that we're forgiven. We have inner peace. And that inner peace brings us joy. We have access to God forever. We'll never be disappointed. That brings us joy. Filled with peace and hope and joy. We can even rejoice when we're suffering. It's hard to rejoice when you're suffering. But if you understand what you have in Christ and understand that peace and joy and that's in your heart and know that in Romans we also have Romans 8 28 which is my second favorite verse of the Bible Romans 8 28 says all things not some things not a few things all things say that all things are going to work for our good that's pretty phenomenal I mean, there are all kinds of things going on in our lives. God says, I'm going to take everything that happens in your life and turn it and twist it and do whatever it needs to be done so that ultimately whatever happens to you will be for your ultimate good. And you will never be disappointed. What a promise. What a great blessing to know that we have that. And one of my staff in Bozier, one of my guys, that my guy stayed with me for over 20 years that took care of the building, wonderful guys. And uh, 
One of the joys of my life was my last year there. We did this huge love offering for them and just loved on them. But this one guy that I had for 20-something years, every time that I ever spoke to him and asked him, how you doing, Billy? Every time, it's all good. It's all good. Now, there were times when he was hurting, he said, it's all good. Time when his wife was deathly in the hospital, it's all good. He grasped Romans 8, 28. That no matter what's happening, how bad it looks now, through the eyes of God and eternity, you can know that whatever you're going through, God is going to turn that and change that and use that for your good and his glory. It's going to be all good. All good. Number five is love. Love is why Jesus came. Love is why Jesus died. Love is why Jesus is coming back. And I hope it's soon, basically before the next election, we needed to come back. But he's coming back. Verse 5. And hope does not disappoint us. There it is again. Because God has poured his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. But God, verse 8, demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we're still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the greatest exposition of love in the entire Bible. The love that Jesus poured out on the cross is the same love that he pours into our hearts daily, continually by the Holy Spirit. You think, I know that you've thought about how much God must love you to do what he did for you. To forgive you and to save you and to change you, to live inside you and to give you access to him. And all of that comes from his love and God's love that we can't even grasp it. We can't put our arms around it. But that love, God is literally pouring into your heart through the Holy Spirit on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. God is love. And that love is coming through your life. And he wants that love to just flow through you. Unconditional love, unending love, ultimate love. And, and God's love is a tethered love. God has attached himself to you with his love. And it's a bond that can never, ever be broken. One of the joys of my life in preaching these 56 years is to say to people who think it, they've done the worst thing they could ever do and it's all over for them and they'll never, be, they'll never be happy again and God doesn't love them anymore, to look at them and say, no matter what you have done, I want to tell you, you've never done anything to cause God to love you any less. He loves you with a perfect love and it will never end. God's amazing, amazing love. I was preaching over in, in Oklahoma and the pastor told me about doing a funeral the week before. And there was a lady in the church. She was a good lady. But somehow her mind went in the wrong direction. And she made a bad choice. And for some reason she took off her wedding ring and put it on the sink. And she met a man at a motel. And she died in that motel. And the husband had to go claim her body. And that pastor did the funeral. And he said, as I did that funeral... I, I saw that husband come to that casket for the last time and look into the face of his wife in tears. He said, I could, hear, I could hear him saying to her, I forgive you. I love you. You are my wife. And he reached in his pocket and he took out that ring and he placed it on her finger. You're my wife. I love you. That is amazing love, but nothing compared to how much God loves you. We can't even comprehend how much he loves us. But he loves us with a perfect love, and he will never, ever stop loving us. Number six is power. Power. The Holy Spirit, verse B of five. 
God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. He has given us the Holy Spirit. All that God is, he is in us through the Holy Spirit. All that he is in us, he wants to be through us. He has filled us with his love. He has filled us with his power, but he does not want that love and power to stay in our lives. He wants it to continually flow through us to others. He wants us to to be him in, in our world, to be God's love. And he wants to give us the power to do what he ever asked us to do. So he's flowing his love and his power through our lives continually. How much power? Well, think about creation. That's pretty cool. He pulled that off rather well. What about the virgin birth? It's never happened before. What about the resurrection? Dead, alive. That same power, and and I'm not giving you my ideas. The Bible teaches us, the Bible says that resurrection power is available in the life of the weakest Christian. Excuses all gone. Take I can out of your vocabulary. Because resurrection power is being poured into our hearts and lives. And then in verses 6 through 10, Paul gives a summary statement of our benefits and our blessings in Christ. God has already done the hardest thing Paul wants us to know, sending Jesus to die for our sins when we were still his enemies. That was the hardest thing. Now he's doing the easier thing. He is living in us and flowing his power and his love through this, through us. But then in verse 11, he says, not only is this so, he just, he, just, he just keeps getting more excited, and, and, and here is just, he's going to explode with joy. I just wish I could, uh, we had Paul here to do this, to, because it, it's, you could just hear it, you can feel it. We rejoice in our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. So thinking back to what he was before Christ, And now that Christ has changed him from the inside, literally turned his life upside down, used him in unbelievable ways, filled him with love and power, then he explodes with joy. Since we have been justified and declared righteous, verse 1, remember, we have peace with God and we have the peace of God. In verse 2, we have access to God for eternity. Also in verse 2, we have a hope that everything we hope for will be realized, never be disappointed. In verse 3, not only that, but we have power, love, and joy so much in our hearts that we can rejoice even in our sufferings. It's all good. And then verse 11, and not only is all that so, you feel him getting excited? Just more and more. Not, we, have, we claim we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ because we have received reconciliation. It just gets better and better and better. This, this pastor was preaching in a church and the, a guy just lost it and he, he, he just jumped up and started shouting and, and the problem was that they, it, the pastor was not used to that in that church and he, he lost his sermon, his place, he, he was speechless. And, and so the deacons went to see the man. And he was plowing with his mule, and he saw him coming, and he knew they were coming. And they came, and they said, you know, we hate to say anything, but he said, I, I know, I know, I know, I know what happened. And I know it, it messed him up, and he forgot his place, and I, I'm so sorry, and I, I, won't, I won't do that anymore. He said, I, I was just sitting there, and he, his sermon was just speaking to my heart, and I got to thinking and, and remembering what a rotten, dirty sinner I was, how awful I'd lived my life. 
and, and how God had literally saved me and changed me, and he saved my wife, and he saved my kids, and we had a godly home, and now we have a godly home, and my whole life is turned around. Ah, hold it's me while I shout. <laughs> well, I think that's where Paul is. Peace, access, hope, joy, love, power, that's worth shouting about. Let's pray. Father, speak to our hearts. We have been encouraged in your word. Our hope is in you, and we will not be disappointed. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah.